Good evening again. Um, we uh, obviously have a lot to pray for this 4th of July weekend. It's hard to, hard to believe, but this is the upcoming 4th of July weekend. And as we look at our country, I, I'm going to guess you are as concerned about the future of our country as I am and the direction that it's taking. Um, that's what motivated me to, to preach the sermon that I preached this past Sunday. And um, even though I'm preaching to the choir, as somebody said, you're preaching to the choir. Yes, I am. I'm always preaching to the choir every Sunday. I'm, pre I'm hopefully preaching to the choir <laughs> anyways, and that I'm trusting that most of the people, the majority of the people at church are saved. I know that not all are, and so I do, you know, keep that in consideration. But I'm, in a sense, always preaching to the choir. Uh, so tonight, we're going to continue our, our tradition, since we're live streaming, of doing the Bible study first and having the prayer later. And again, as I look at Lamentations 5, and we finish this up, I took a couple breaks and did some different things, but as we look at Lamentations 5, I want to correlate something in Lamentations 5 to what I see happening uh, today. And, uh, you know, here we have in Lamentations, Jeremiah's laments. We believe they were Jeremiah's laments. We can't prove that 100% positively, but that's what most theologians believe for a variety of good, sound reasons. And, uh, and so we, we feel we're pretty accurate in saying they're Jeremiah's laments over Jerusalem and its destruction. And what we have to remember is Jerusalem was destroyed because of her sins, because of the sins of her people. So we have God's people getting to a point in their life where their relationship with God is so bad that they are uh, continually practicing certain types of sin, idolatry being the one that is mentioned most often. But there are others mentioned by Jeremiah as well, and uh, including justice, which is a very current theme today. And... Um, and so it gets to the point where, where God allows the Babylonians to come in. They were spared from the Assyrian captivity about a hundred and some years, almost 200 years earlier, when God miraculously intervened. You remember that story, right? With the godly king Hezekiah and uh, the, the angel of the Lord striking dead, you know, over well over 100,000, almost 200,000 of the Assyrian army. They wake up in the morning and there's so many dead, they think, okay, I think we ought to leave. Something's going on here. <laughs> and they leave. But God still has an impending judgment to come upon the nation of Israel because he knew that they would not forsake their sin and, and that proved to be true. And so eventually the Babylonians, which he had foretold them would happen, the Babylonians come in and ransack Jerusalem. And they are victorious in conquering Jerusalem and carrying off many, many Jews into captivity, but doing a lot of horrific things to the citizens, terribly horrific things that will, again, we've seen it earlier in, in Lamentations, we'll see it again today. Things that we all hope to avoid in our lifetime, that we hope never happens to America or actually to any, any people anywhere. So let's look at Lamentations 5. But before we do, actually, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day and for your word. We thank you for the instruction it gives to us, the guidance it gives to us, the revelation of your character that it gives to us, and the message of salvation that it gives to us. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, who came into the world and died for our sins and then rose again, proving he was who he claimed to be and now offering eternal life to all who will put their hope and trust completely in him for their salvation, not in themselves, not in what they do, but in what Jesus did on the cross for them. Father, I pray that each and every one of us has done that and that all who are listening have done that, and if not, that they would do it tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. Guide us as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 1, Remember, O Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens, our homes to foreigners. That was the Babylonians that they're talking about. We have become orphans and fatherless. And that was as a result of the warfare that transpired. I believe this to be literally true, that they had become, many of their uh, children had become orphans as their parents were killed in the conquest, and some of them had become, um, you know, fatherless as a result of the conquest. Our mothers, like widows, many of their husbands probably died in battle. We must buy the water we drink. 
Our wood can be had only at a price. So the Babylonians are requiring some, you know, very strict things for some very basic things, uh, the necessities of life. Wood to build a fire, to cook your food. They didn't have electric ranges or even gas ranges. They depended on wood and uh, fire uh, for their cooking. And, of course, water is absolutely essential. But now they have to buy, of course, today, that's, did you ever think, you know, when I was a kid, I never thought you'd buy water. Did, did you ever think you'd have to buy water someday? And now, how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you buy water for your drinking water? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. So at least half of us, sometimes, sometimes we, osmosis system, right, so you've got to, yeah, so we're buying water too, but we're doing it for mainly, I think most of us are probably doing it for health reasons. We're, we're a little concerned about maybe the tap water or um, if you have a well, you know, what's coming out of it. Um, here, they had to buy the water, I believe, because they were conquered by the Babylonians and the Babylonians were charging them for everything, everything. And so we must buy the water we drink. Our wood can be had only at a price. Those who pursue us are at our heels. We are weary and find no rest. We submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread, which they were warned not to do. You know, they appealed to Egypt, and, and as a result, God had told them not to do that in advance, and he said most of you would die there, and he said only a, only a few would make it back, and that's what happened. Only a few uh, escaped death when, of those that were in Egypt. Our fathers sinned, verse 7, and this is the, this is the verse I'm going to, um, sort of piggy tail off of in a little bit. Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their judgment or their punishment. Slaves rule over us, and there is none to free us from their hands. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because the sword in the desert. Because of the sword in the desert, our skin is hot as an oven, feverish from hunger. Women have been ravished in Zion, and virgins in the town of Judah. Princes have been hung by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Young men toil at the millstones. Boys stagger under loads of wood. The elders are gone from the city gate. The young men have stopped their music. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate with jackals prowling over it. You, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore to us, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return, renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so they're longing for what they used to enjoy, and all that they used to enjoy has been stripped from them. And, and it's a result of their sins, and that's recognized twice just in this particular lament. There's five laments here, and, and each one contains basically, um, well, the two of the laments are, are uh, there's, um, it's twice the Hebrew alphabet, and the rest are the same. Each one represents a letter. The lament has the same number of laments or verses in it as the Hebrew alphabet. But um, here we see twice they mention the fact that they're being punished for their sins. Verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7, For our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment. And then uh, we just saw it a little while uh, later where they said, Woe to us, uh, in verse 16, the end of verse 16, Woe to us, for we have sinned. So they recognize that. But what's interesting is in verse 7, it says, Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their judgment or their punishment. Now, I, I think they're probably alluding to the fact, maybe in some cases, that their fathers had died. But it also may be more than that. It may be because the term our fathers oftentimes is used in the Old Testament, if you read through the Old Testament, is used of their ancestors that go all the way back to the time of Abraham. In fact, Abraham is often referred to as our father Abraham. Even in the New Testament, even in the New Testament, in the, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 8, the Jews refer to Abraham as their father. And uh, Jesus says something, you know, quite alarming to them. He says, hey, Abraham's not your father. Your father's the devil, and you do the will of your father. But they thought of that. They thought of fathers in that sense. They look back, and it could, it could have been their immediate fathers, their actual biological 
moms and dads, or their dads and fathers, um, or it could have been their grandfathers, their great grandfathers, their great great grandfathers, their great 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 grandfathers, because the term our fathers is used oftentimes in that sense. And so what I see here in verse 7, when it says, Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment, is I see what some has labeled as, have labeled as the ripple effect or the consequences to sin. And by ripple effect, what they mean is, is, you know, you toss a stone into a body of water and the ripples go out and out and out. And there's, a, there's an ever almost expanding, increasing effect on the water around it. And the same is true with sin. And so when our fathers sin, whether it's our immediate fathers or our grandfathers or our great-grandfathers, there are ripple effects, if you will, to their sin uh, that, that affect us. Because uh, there's this, um, there's this uh, paradox in the Old Testament where you have the fact that the Bible says that God oftentimes visits the iniquity of the, of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And yet then you find later on, he says, um, you know, a, a son shall not be punished for his father, nor a father for his son. And, and so how do you reconcile those two teachings in the Old Testament? Well, the only way to reconcile it is that in, in one sense, if um, my dad commits murder, I'm not to be punished for the fact that he committed murder. But because my dad commits murder, on the other hand, and he, and he might end up in prison today, and, and that day and age, it would have been a different type of punishment. There was no you know, uh, penal system like there, is, there, was a, there was a judicial system, but there were no prisons. There were refuge, cities of refuge, but there were no prisons. That's an interesting concept because, you know, we sort of think of it as a, a society can't exist without that. However, in place of that, they had what we might call indentured servitude, where a person would pay out. Of course, if it was murder, they'd be put to death. The death penalty was imposed on a whole lot more crimes than it is today. Today, slowly, uh, over a period of time, uh, more and more crimes that used to demand the death penalty are no longer getting the death penalty, right? And depending on what state you live in, in some states, I don't know, some states I think have, maybe Luke knows that, are there states that have completely abolished the death penalty? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So even if you murder, cold-blooded, premeditated murder, you don't get put to death yourself, yeah. So more and more that, that's happening. In the Old Testament, if you murdered somebody and it was proven, you were put to death. If you raped somebody that had cried out, uh, because it was assumed that if, if they didn't want to be raped, they would cry out, if they were in the city anyways. If they were in the country, it didn't matter. They didn't have to cry out. It was just assumed that the person was a, did it wrongfully. Um, but rape demanded the death penalty. Um, but then when it came to things like theft, there was basically a system of restitution. And if you couldn't pay that restitution, then you became indebted to that person and became their slave. That's different than taking a free person and then putting them into slavery. It's different. It's more of a what we might call a type of um, indentured servitude. Uh, but that was that was the system in place in that day and age. So there weren't no, there weren't any prisons. But uh, that's a long rabbit trail to say simply that today, if your father committed murder, you wouldn't be tried for his murder. So on the one hand, the son isn't punished for the father. On the other hand, him being in prison is going to affect you. Right? There's no longer dad's income. There's no longer dad's influence. And we talked about homes, you know, fatherless homes and how the, the children are affected in several negative ways uh, that sociologists have discovered quite a few years ago and, and reaffirm that, reaffirm that, reaffirm it. But its role in our current troubled society never seems to gain a limelight. Have you noticed that? We don't, we don't really... I don't think, maybe I've missed it, but we don't really emphasize the role of, uh, of dads in the home and the positive effects that that can have on the home. So that's the ripple effects. There's always ripple effects. And as I thought about this, as I looked at this, that's the first thing I have it actually written in my Bible. Or so I have a little, I've got notes all over in my Bible and I have beside that particular verse, ripple effect. Because I've talked about ripple effects before. And so I got ripple effect there. But I thought of that in relationship to our current situation. Um, are we as a nation maybe experiencing some ripple effects for past sins? Do you know what I'm saying? For past sins. 
I, I believe forced slavery was wrong. I don't believe all forms of slavery under every situation is wrong. The Bible not only allowed for it, but seemed to advocate it in, in relationship to the person who was unable to pay their debts. But again, it was a different type of slavery. It wasn't a permanent, lifelong, generational slavery. It didn't go from father to son to grandson. It was until that person paid off their debt. So it was a different kind. Pardon? And it wasn't race-related either. Thank you. Good point. It was not race-related either. But what I've wondered about is, have we allowed um, injustice in the past? When I say we, our fathers, did they allow injustice in the past? And we are feeling the ripple effects of that now through the young people who, who can't seem to get their minds off of that. And, and maybe, maybe in some cases, for good things. Now, let me make it, make it perfectly clear. I don't believe that the looting, the violence, the vandalism, the pulling down of statues, the hurting of people in any manner is in any way justified. It is not justified. In any way. And, and even when God brought the Assyrians against Israel to punish them for their sins, and when God brought the Babylonians against Judah to punish them for their sins, he also said, when Israel was saying, why are you doing this? You're taking a wicked nation to punish us. God says, you know what? I'm going to punish the Assyrians after they punish you. And you know what? I'm going to punish the Babylonians after they punish you. God holds everybody accountable. So, so if our forefathers practice injustice... And if our young people, maybe, are looking at some of that and believing that it's still continuing, but also see that as something that was allowed, that we allowed, and inferring that, it, you know, by some of the statements of some people today that it's still going on, I, I think maybe we're feeling the ripple effects to some extent of some forms of injustice. The Bible talks a lot about justice, a whole lot. And it talks a lot about reaping what we sow or the ripple effects. In fact, in, in Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, we have one man's sin that, that affects 36 men, men's lives. Uh, in Joshua chapter 7, we, it says, uh, one man, uh, there were, excuse me, I'm, I was going to read the verse, but I don't have the verse here. <laughs> it's the sin of Achan, and where Israel had taken some of the forbidden things. And as a result, 36 Israelis die in a particular battle. And God says, it's because of what Achan did. It's because Israel sinned. And so there's that ripple effect. Um, Ezekiel chapter 8 talks about the same, there's that same concept there. Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 5, says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation of, of those who hate me. And so there's, there's the ripple effect. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. There's another form of that ripple effect. Uh, you know, when good, righteous um, leaders rule, it's better for the people. When bad people rule, it's worse for the people. There's that ripple. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. There's that ripple effect. And, and I think maybe we're, we're experiencing some of that. That's some of the problem. That is not the whole problem. The problem is, I think, much bigger, much broader than that. But I've been thinking about this as I was doing this study, and I thought, maybe to some extent we are feeling the ripple effect. And maybe, maybe it's a way of God saying to us, realize how important it is the way that you live your life now. Because what we do now, the way we live now, uh, the character of our lives will affect our children, our children's children, and their children's children, and maybe 200 and some years down the road, their children. There's that ripple effect. Deuteronomy 16, verses 18 through 20, talks about justice. Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord your God is giving you. And they shall judge the people fairly. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. Does God value justice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very clear there. Exodus chapter 23, 
Verses 1 through 7, do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. Now, that would apply to today's situation as well, right? <laughs> when you give a testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure you take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death for I will not acquit the guilty. Deuteronomy 24 verses 14 through 18. Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or a foreigner living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Now, it was a time, even after the Declaration of Independence, which says we hold these truths to be what? Self-evident. That all, isn't that what it says? All men are created equal. But did we treat all men as equals. And when I say we, I am I know, not you and I, did our fathers treat all men as equals? Or were some races not treated as equals and not given all of the, the rights and the privileges that we had as whites? And I think, I think we have to answer to that, that that was true. That there was a time when blacks were denied the rights that whites enjoyed, that there was a time when they were denied the justice that whites enjoyed. We have to admit that there is, there, that is, that is a, a very, what would you say, um, I don't want to use the wrong terminology here, a, a negative part of our past. And I'd, I'd like to suggest it's sinful, because when we pervert justice, when we don't when we don't display justice to everybody fairly in what we see here, the fatherless, the widow, uh, the poor, uh, the rich even, we, when, we don't, when we don't execute and display justice fairly and equally to all, it's sin. Now, you may say, but I never owned slaves. Well, neither did I. And my family's from the north. I don't know that any of my ancestors ever did. My wife, is, her mom's from Italy. Um, and her dad was born here, but his parents were from Italy. And as far as I know, they didn't take place in any of the American slave trade, right? So it's not that we own slaves and that we directly maybe perverted judgment or didn't, didn't execute judgment. I hope none of us have been guilty of, of not treating everybody fairly and justly. But have our fathers. I don't mean my literal dad. I mean fathers in the sense that the Old Testament uses it. Our ancestors. Did any of our ancestors, now some of you say, nope, I came from the Philippines. Wasn't my ancestors. Nope, I came from the Netherlands. Where did your family come from, Luke? Somewhere over there. Finland and Hungary. Nope, it wasn't my ancestors. You know, I, of course, maybe, because we got to remember, the, the slave trade uh, was in more than just America. It, it happened in North Africa. It happened in, in England. It happened in... Um, I think in Spain, in Spain, in, I mean, and then if you go back far enough, every, every world power and every foreign nation, the Romans had slaves, the Greeks had slaves, everybody had slaves. So, but what I'm saying is, in our past, I think it's pretty apparent that in America, we weren't executing justice fairly to all races. And is what we're experiencing, to some degree, the ripple effects of that? Have our young people looked at the past and said, this was terrible, this was horrible, and then buy into the narrative that it's still going on today to some extent, which I, maybe to some extent, I don't think it's systemic, I don't think, I know there's going to be people that disagree with that, um, but are reacting to all of that. And in a sense, we're feeling the ripple effect. Now, does making, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that that justifies looting, stealing, mugging, um, raping, killing, uh, vandalism, tearing down statues. No, in no way. It does not justify that. But that may be a part of the ripple effect. I mean, you look at the horrible things that happened to the nation of the Israel. Israel. And you can say, you know what? All they did was worship a few little idols. 
me, come on, they're stone and wood and they can't do anything anyways. Even God says that through the prophets. They can't speak and they can't do anything. And, and so some of their women get raped as a result of that. Uh, some of their men are killed as a result of that. Uh, some, some of the women eat their young. Remember, we saw that in previous chapters as a result of that. Those ripple effects can really be serious. <laughs> and, um, and again, it, uh, I'm not justifying what's... Uh, that doesn't justify what happened here either. The Pab Babylonians were punished. And those people, uh, these young people, and maybe sometimes older than young, but it seems to be a lot of young people that are burning down places, uh, that are um, knocking old people to the ground in some cases, uh, robbing Amazon trucks. You've seen all the videos doing... God will take care of them, too. They're not going to get away with it. They may think that, that this is a cry for justice. They may think it somehow, uh, in a warped way, think that it's justified because of the injustices of the past. They're not going to get away with that. Because, because God holds every person accountable for their sins. And, and these riots, let me say this, and these protests, I believe, will have ripple effects as well and may change our nation forever, and I don't necessarily think it'll be for the good. May, maybe there'll be a keener awareness of equality, maybe, or maybe it'll create even more tension and lead to more hatred and more bigotry. I'm not sure what the ripple effects will be. Time will tell us. History will help us to understand what the ripple effects were from the movement that's going on today. But I believe there'll be ripple effects even from what's going on today. And so I say all of that to remind us, it's very serious how we live our life because there's always these ripple effects. Or if you want to put it in the language of Galatians, we, we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow as individuals, as people groups, and as a nation. And uh, I think maybe in part we're doing that now and they will reap what they're sowing in the future. And I fear for that because, you know, at, at first the, ref, the, the, um, the, uh, the revolution, excuse me, the revolution seems good, right? When uh, Stalin and Lenin uh, led the Bolshevik revolution they, and they gained victory over the Russian czars, it was, yeah, yeah. And then how many years did it take before millions of Russians were being killed by Stalin? And Hitler had his um, brown shirts and Mussolini had his black shirts. And Mussolini walks in with, what, 44,000 black shirts and just takes over the, the palace, you know, and becomes the ruler of Italy. How good was that later on? Mussolini, Mussolini was fighting for reform in Italy. Did you know that? Before he took over, he was a newspaper. Account. He wasn't even a politician. A lot of people aren't aware of that. He wasn't a politician. But he started getting involved in political ideologies through his comments through the newspapers. And then gathered, started forming his own band of people that wanted to see reform or revolution and ended up taking over Italy. Hitler, Hitler started off wanting to, you know, make Germany great again. Oh, that sounds almost like... <laughs> I didn't mean to make that sound so much like Donald Trump. I'm not equating the two. I like Donald Trump. I'm, you know, he, I think he's a good president. You know, but Hitler, the people, a lot of people were behind Hitler when he rose to power. But what a lot of people don't realize is his black shirts went out and one night they killed a hundred political opponents in one night. They call it the, knife of, the night of long knives because they use knives to do it silently. So the gunshots couldn't be heard, so people wouldn't blame it on his, his um, brown shirts. And, the, you know, so, and, and then Nazism was born. And so the revolution seems good at first, but there's ripple effects. And in so many of those, the ripple effects were not good. And the Nazi revolution wasn't good. The Bolshevik revolution wasn't good. Mussolini revolution wasn't good. I don't think we're going to see a lot of good out of this revolution. This cultural revolution that's taking place. There will be ripple effects. But for us, for you and I that are sitting here today, we may need to think about uh, how are we living our lives now? Because it will have ripple effects too. 
Am I showing justice to all people? Am I living by that creed that we say we believe, that we are all created equal? We are all the sons of Adam. We are all the descendants of Noah. And do we treat everybody like that? And so we have to think of that sometimes in relationship to our own lives. It's, you know, lamentations, in a sense, um, maybe shows us a portrait of what could happen to other people groups and other nations if they don't correct their sinful living as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening and uh, for the word. And uh, certainly that in America's past, even though there were a lot of God-fearing good people, and we don't want to... We don't want to lump everybody into the, into the same box and say they were all the same. And there were a lot of people that didn't agree with slavery. There were a lot of people that never practiced slavery. And there were even those slave owners that, that maybe were simply a product of their times, doesn't justify it, but maybe didn't even really think a lot about what they were doing. And uh, so help us, help us to give careful consideration to our ways uh, to make sure our lives, as much as possible, lines up with the teachings of Scripture in, in every way, not just in going to church and praying and reading our Bibles, but in the way that we treat our fellow human beings, in the justice that we show to them, in the kindness that we show to them, in the help that we give to them, in, in the way that we treat them. So, Father, help us to learn from this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me turn off the live stream and we'll go to the Lord in prayer with our prayer requests.